Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out despite the kind of crazy weather that we've been having here. Uh, I'm Cameron Hummels, a postdoc here, and welcome to our first uh, public lecture and stargazing of the semester. Hopefully we will actually have stargazing. I didn't think that we would, but the clouds have cleared to some degree. Uh, so uh, assuming it's still relatively clear in 30 minutes, we will be able to observe a few things, although it won't be on the adjacent field because it's closed because they're doing construction on it, but we'll be set up on the sidewalk outside um, and see some of the brighter objects. So uh, as I alluded, this is the first public lecture of the, the year. Um, if you saw at the front, we have the, the full schedule for the next six months. You're free to take one of those, and uh, we welcome you to come back. Next month is Mike Wong talking about the science of Star Trek, which should be really cool. In fact, there may be, uh, in our Q&A panel afterwards, there may be some former Star Trek actors who were in different roles in, in, in various stages of the, of the, uh, the program. So it should be exciting. Um, and in case this is your first one tonight, actually, ha raise your hand if this is your first public lecture here. Okay, a decent number, a decent number of returnees. Um, so since this is your first time, basically what will happen is uh, when I'm done yapping here in a minute or so, uh, we'll have our esteemed speaker speak to us for 30 minutes or so, uh, take questions, and then you guys are welcome to go out and either observe on the telescope, assuming again that it's clear, um, for until 9 o'clock, or we'll have a Q&A panel set up in here by a number of experts in the field, uh, some graduate students, some postdocs and such, answering questions on a variety of different topics. So you guys are welcome to stick around in here or go outside or come back in here and answer or ask whatever questions you have, burning questions you have about astronomy, physics, and astrophysics. Um, in addition to our event next month, we also have Astronomy on Tap, which is uh, at a local bar at in Old Town, where we have informal science talks, which are given uh, while you have a beer. And again, like this event, it's free, and you guys are welcome to come. Uh, so that I'll I'll put the poster up in the back, but it's also on our website, outreach.astro.caltech.edu. So, um, without any further holdups, our speaker for tonight is uh, Dr. Fiona Harrison. She is the division chair of the entire physics, math, and astronomy departments here at Caltech, so she's way up high in the ranks. And more importantly, she is the principal investigator for a really dynamic space telescope called New Star uh, that I'm hoping that she's gonna talk about tonight. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Fiona Harrison. Well, it's really fun to be here um, to give a lecture in the same room where many of the Caltech community watched the New Star telescope launch. And what I'm going to tell you about is the universe through X-ray eyes, but in particular, a, a specific set of X-ray eyes. And that's those of the New Star space mission. Uh, this is a space telescope that launched in uh, June of 2012. It was conceived here at Caltech. Much of the hardware was built uh, one floor below you. And it is the very first telescope to be able to make true images of the cosmos in high energy x-rays. And what I want to share with you tonight is a little bit about uh, the development of the telescope and the science of the telescope and what we learn that is fundamentally new by observing uh, the universe through X-ray eyes. Now, I just want to say that New Star is what we call a small explorer. It's NASA's smallest scale standalone uh, astrophysics mission. And people often ask me how small is small. Well, it's 120 million for everything, including the launch and the science, which sounds huge, right? But in fact, uh, compared to things like um, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, it's about, it's, it's several, a thousandfold uh, smaller. So I'd like to start with the big picture and remind you that we truly live in a golden age of astrophysics. And I, in the last 20 years, our 
picture of the universe has changed in fundamental ways. And I'll say 20 years ago, I was finishing my graduate career. And at that time, we argued about what the age of the universe was to a factor of two. Now, we know it's 13.77 billion years old, and we're arguing about the third decimal place. Okay. Uh, we have a fundamental picture of how structures uh, grew in the universe and uh, some other things that were completely unknown when I was in graduate school is that most of the matter that uh, causes gravitational forces and uh, shapes the growth of structures like galaxies uh, is, was, is invisible, was unknown. Uh, most of the energy density of the universe uh, is in a form of, that we call dark energy, which just uh, sort of hides our ignorance. Uh, we don't know what it is, but we know that it is now controlling the current expansion of the universe, the accelerated expansion. And what we can actually see and study the normal matter is a few percent, right? All of this was not known 20 years ago. And how is it that in such a short time, in, you know, speaking of uh, human time scales, all right, uh, we have come to fundamentally change our view of the universe. And the reason is through technological advances combined with access to space. And that has enabled us to view the sky in completely new ways, to use different observational windows, to be able to view the universe in microwaves, the same microwaves, by the way, that you use to warm your uh, cup of water, all right? If we can observe the universe in microwaves, and we have in the last 20 years, look back to 400,000 years after the Big Bang. This is what enabled us to understand the age of the universe. To look at the universe in infrared, which we experience as heat, all right? By looking in infrared, we can look back to the very first stars and galaxies that formed in the universe that eventually evolved into uh, the structures that we know today. And then, of course, in the visible universe, uh, where we can look for new planets, we can uh, study galaxies, and even black holes. So what do microwaves, infrared radiation, and uh, optical light have in common. So it never ceases to amaze me that they're fundamentally all the same physical phenomenon. They're called electromagnetic radiation. They vary. If you think of a wave, just think of a wave on the water and the distance between two crests. That's the wavelength. Same physical phenomenon differing only in the distance between the crests of the waves. And so if we look at radio, okay, that's the distance between the crest and the waves is the size of a building. If we look at uh, the, the visible, it's the size of a protozoa. And if you look at the X-ray, so X-rays are also electromagnetic radiation, but the wavelength, the distance between those crests is the size of an atom to the size of a nucleus, right? The other thing, uh, to realize is that if you have an object, what wavelength of light, of electromagnetic radiation, uh, it radiates depends on its temperature, right? So things that are really cold, like the very early universe, uh, redshifted, uh, we see uh, at low frequencies. Uh, and things that are very, very hot, the hottest structures in the universe radiate in the x-rays. Things that are warm, like dust in the regions where stars are forming, those radiate in the infrared. And so if we want to look at all the things in the universe, from the very cold to the very hot, the most energetic, the densest uh, regions, we have to cover the whole spectrum. And access to space is what enab has enabled us to do this. Now, the reason that you need to get to space is because our atmosphere, it's a good thing we have our atmosphere because it protects us from all the cosmic radiation that would otherwise 
uh, damage our uh, cells. However, it also shields all this radiation with which we can study the universe. And there's only small bands, like in the visible. Of course, that's why our eyes evolved to see in the visible, because that's a radiation that penetrates the atmosphere uh, in the radio. Right? But if you look at high energies, x-rays, gamma rays, a huge gamut of the spectrum, that radiation cannot reach the ground, and we need to get into space. OK, so now you know that x-rays are uh, just another kind of light. They don't have magical cleansing powers. Uh, this guy can't use them to uh, look through walls. OK. Uh, but to detect them, we need much more sophisticated technology than that guy's glasses. And that is what we uh, developed for the New Star mission. So now I'm showing you this electromagnetic spectrum again, focusing on what we call the X-ray band. And we d divide this band into low energy and high energy. All right? And in the low energy X-ray band, we have had very powerful telescopes like uh, NASA's Chandra and ESA's XMM-Newton telescope that have peered deep into the universe, because they are really true telescopes that focus light. Uh, until New Star, we had not any telescope that could look in the high energy or blue region of uh, the X-ray band in any, with any sensitivity. New Star has improved. Uh, the sensitivity by a factor of 100, the crispness of the images by a factor of 100 that we've had in this band. And it's enabled us, therefore, to look at some of the hottest, densest, most energetic regions in the universe. And I want you to just note quickly, don't worry about the units. They're completely unimportant. But if you look at the number 10, the number 10 has tr is tr traditionally the dividing line between low energy x-rays and low energies, for reasons that I won't get into, correspond to sort of yellow and red colors, and high energy x-rays, which correspond to what you, it, making an analogy to visible light to blue colors. And again, uh, to make an analogy to visible light, what New Star has added is the blue, indigo, and violet to the palette of x-ray colors. And when you can observe the universe in multiple different colors, you get much more information. And again, just going back to the analogy with visible light, this is the antenna galaxy viewed in black and white. Okay? When we add colors, the information we get, so for example, if we view it in the uh, red and yellow colors, that shows us where the warm regions are, where there's warm dust. When we add blue colors, then suddenly we see the hot regions where active young stars are being formed. And so we can dissect in this galaxy the physical processes that are going on in different regions by looking at them in different colors. So what New Star has done, again, is to add the blue, indigo, and violet when we make an x-ray picture of the universe. And these are actual x-ray pictures combining low energy x-rays and high energy x-rays of objects even like our sun, where the blue is what New Star has added. It's where some of the most energetic processes are going on in the sun. This is called the hand of God. And that blue region New Star has found is where particles are being accelerated very close to the speed of light. And that's created very hot energetic regions, which we can now pick out with New Star. So uh, being able to focus at these blue x-ray colors or high energy x-ray colors took a lot of technology development. I'm not going to talk about this much, but I'll tell you that a lot of it, these Brand new kinds of x-ray detectors were built. The flight ones right down, right beneath this uh, auditorium by including many students and postdocs from Caltech. Because it's a small mission, they actually got to uh, work on the flight hardware. And so it was about 15 years from the 
first serious technology development, which I started when I came to Caltech as a, a young professor, uh, and about four years to actually build the mission. And this picture here shows the spacecraft. The spacecraft, so we actually put the instrument together up the hill at JPL. We shipped it across the country to uh, Dulles, Virginia, where we put it together with the spacecraft, which is the thing that uh, points the telescope. And then we drove it up to Vandenberg Air Force Base, where uh, we put New Star in its rocket. Now, it's a fairly unusual rocket because New Star, as I mentioned, is a small explorer, inexpensive. So we wanted, we had to launch it on a small rocket, and it's a very unusual small rocket. It's a rocket that fits under the belly of the L-1011 aircraft. Now, most of you don't look old enough to remember the L-1011, but uh, sort of the predecessor to the 747. And here, the whole telescope part of New Star uh, fits in this region right here. Okay, so I want you to note the length of that compared to the length of the aircraft. Right, it's much shorter than the length of the aircraft. Then the aircraft took off from Vandenberg and flew to the Kwajalein Atoll in the South Pacific, where uh, it launched. And the launch is actually pretty interesting. Uh, this is not, I'm gonna, I want to show you a video of what the launch looks like. This is not actually the New Star launch. New Star launched at night, couldn't see anything. But this is called a Pegasus launch vehicle. And what happens is the aircraft takes off. There's the rocket underneath the belly, right? Then it flies up to 30,000 feet or so. The rocket drops for five seconds and then ignites, then actually launches in front of the aircraft. Then it gets up to about 600 kilometers above the Earth, where it goes around the entire Earth every 90 minutes, all right, to observe uh, the universe. And unfortunately, I forgot to turn my sound on, so you won't get the full effect but of the launch. Anyway, um, I will say that the uh, CEO of the company that makes this launch vehicle is a friend of mine um, and uh, also a Caltech trustee and he said you know what I'm gonna offer you the very special opportunity to ride in the air airplane for the launch but I thought that landing uh, taking off with a ton of solid explosive underneath the aircraft was an experience I didn't need to have so I decided instead to be at the Mission Operations Center at UC Berkeley. Now, of course, the other advantage of being here is you get, you see not just the launch, but then when all the data starts to come in and we have to unfold big arrays to get power, you can see all of that happening. And so here actually is the New Star launch uh, viewed on, uh, from the Mission Operations Center. Now, Again, I forgot my sound, to turn my sound on, but this, here in this very room, this is Hamitman Auditorium with one of my graduate students taking the video, that's why. This is the launch, and it was a successful launch. Um, picture perfect. Now, launches are usually quite uh, harrowing, right? Because sometimes they don't work. But I wasn't actually worried about the launch because I figured the rocket's going to go up or it'll go down. I have absolutely no control over it and it'll be over quickly. Right? What I was actually worried about was what had to happen uh, nine days later. Now, I just want to show actually for time scale, this is my daughter out here in front of Hamitman. Stand up, Joanna. She was four years old. Now she's in the fourth grade, so there's your time scale. <laughs> but anyway, what had to happen uh, nine days after launch? Well, if you were astute, I told you to remember how long that uh, shroud was that the, the telescope had to fit in compared to the airplane, right? 
much shorter. But if you remember that view graph I showed you that had the pictures of the telescopes, Chandra, XMM, and New Star, they're very long. They're all 10 meters, or 33 feet are the length of the school bus. So how do we accomplish that? Well, nine days after launch, what we did is we sent a command to the instruments, and that set off a sequence of events where a tinker toy-like structure of tens of thousands of piece parts deployed out of what we lovingly called the trash can in integration and tests. And this whole process took 24 minutes. So when the Mars guys talk about their seven minutes of terror, that's nothing. This was 24 minutes of terror, because I knew we had never actually done this fully assembled on the ground, and when we had done it not fully assembled, it didn't always work. But on orbit, it worked perfectly. Uh, the new star telescope deployed nine days after the launch, and since then has been uh, observing the heavens in high energy or blue colors of x-rays. And I just want to show you what a huge advance qualitatively New Star has made observationally. Now, I want to point out that there have been very crude telescopes that have worked in these high energy or blue colors of x-rays. Right? But they're kind of like pinhole cameras. They're very insensitive. And this is an image uh, from one of those crude telescopes, or I won't even call it a telescope, cameras, uh, centered on the heart of our own Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, where they, we know there's a six uh, million uh, solar mass black hole. All right, And if you look at that image, that's about uh, one degree uh, on, a, on the side. And you can see that it can only see about six sources. All right? If you take one resolution element in that image and blow it up and observe it with New Star, here's what you see. You can see the heart of our galaxy, where it's that, there's that supermassive black hole. Uh, energetic regions where particles are being accelerated close to the speed of light, things that we could never see before. And if you note, this is sort of a false color image where, again, the high energy x-rays are in blue. You see this blue haze surrounding the supermassive black hole at the heart of our Milky Way. Right? Now, we analyzed that blue haze that had never been seen before. And what it is, it's a large collection of dead remnants of massive stars that are eating matter and glowing in the high energy x-rays. And there's so many of them that uh, it creates a haze. And this has never been seen before. And it's still quite a mystery uh, why they're there. But this was a brand new discovery made within the first month that we turned the telescope on due to the, the ability to look at, the, un at uh, the heart of the Milky Way uh, in a new way. Now, of course, one thing we take very seriously with New Star is getting our results out to the public. And so this is when we reported this new discovery. This is how it was picked up uh, in the press. So zombie stars howling as they feed. I guess that's accurate enough. So what I'm going to spend the last few minutes telling you about is just one result uh, from New Star that really highlights, again, what you can learn when you look at the universe in a different way, in a different uh, color of light for the first time. And in fact, this result was uh, our first journal cover. This is the Sedona Journal of Emergence. And this is actually New Star's uh, first press image of the remnant of an exploded star. And my postdoc found this while he was uh, browsing in Roman's bookstore, where astrology is right next to astronomy. 
right? And he said, oh, I recognize that image. I made that image. And in fact, it's properly credited to NASA. Uh, but if you can't read this red writing, what it says is this new of view of the historical supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A, located 11,000 light years away, was taken by NASA. Inside, Cassiopeia speaks through Robert Shapiro. Now, what Robert Shapiro heard, I don't know because I didn't read the article, but at any rate, this was our first journal cover. So, what we've learned with New Star is uh, something fundamentally new about the ec explosions that are called supernovae that forge the elements from the soup of hot hydrogen and helium that exi existed shortly after the universe was born. So today, 13.8 billion years after the creation of this hot homogeneous universe, we live in a rich mix of chemical elements. The calcium, the nitrogen, uh, the things that make up your body were all forged in supernova remnants. And this, what you're seeing here is a computer simulation of how uh, the universe evolved from this soup to the rich uh, place that it is today. And so you see these supernovae, uh, supernova explosions, which are massive stars, which are distributing, forging and distributing uh, the chemical elements that make up uh, life, planets, and the material in your body. So just a little more background about what a supernova, what causes a supernova explosion. When massive stars, something like 10 times the mass of the sun, burn uh, their nuclear fuel, so they burn uh, hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, but eventually they burn into iron, or a good fraction of the core burns to iron. And then physics tells us, I won't go into the details, that you can't burn iron and get energy out, and so you can't produce heat, and so gravity takes over, and the star collapses and explodes and uh, distributes the elements these elements that are fused inside this great fusion reaction in the, in, reaction in the star uh, into the universe. But how stars actually explode has been a profound mystery. It turns out that it's really hard to get something that's imploding, this star that's burned all its fuel, shrinking under gravity, to explode. And the mechanisms for this have frustrated uh, theorists for decades. And uh, a lot of brain power and computer power has been waste, I mean, spent uh, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get car, uh, stars to explode. And theorists are quite clever. They've invented mechanisms that they sort of add ad hoc well, I don't know, there's some theorists here, so sorry, but somewhat ad hoc, <laughs> to the explosion that uh, can make the star actually explode. And one of these mechanisms uh, is the sloshing around of the star in this explosion. And I want to just replay part of this, wind it back a bit. So what you can see is here the explosion has stalled. And these clever theorists then add something, which is sort of the, we think, turbulent, bubbling, mixing, sloshing around of the core of the star, which then adds energy, adds, uh, does work to make the star explode. Now, does this happen in reality? We don't know, or at least we didn't know before New Star. Now, I will say this, I love this because I'm an experimentalist. I'm always fundamentally uh, suspicious of large computer simulations. This computer simulation was done, by the way, by researchers here at Caltech and at Berkeley. Uh, this is a bowl of water, okay? And there's water being injected into the bowl, all right? Where the bowl gets deeper, you can see a discontinuity. And as you turn up the rate where the water falls on, you can see this sloshing happening. 
So this, this sloshing around of the core uh, of the star can actually be reproduced in two dimensions in a bowl of water, but, and theorists know that it can actually make a star explode, but does it, is that actually the mechanism? Well, maybe, maybe not. There are other mechanisms that uh, theorists have uh, postulated, like if a star is rapidly spinning, maybe you get a structure that looks like this, and I won't go into the details, but looks kind of like a <coughs> jet coming out each side, and that can also make a star explode. But what you want to note is the shape of these two explosions are very different. In the one case, that simulation I just showed, it's kind of bubbly, right? And in this case, uh, it's elongated. And so if you could look at the shape of the explosion, you might be able to deduce which mechanism was uh, responsible for the explosion. Now, one way we can hope to learn more about the explosion and its shape is by studying what is left over afterwards. So this explosion happens and hundreds to thousands of years after this explosion glows. And it glows in the low energy x-ray. So that below that dividing line of 10, you can look at these remnants and these are beautiful images by the Chandra x-ray satellite of the explosions of stars, right? And you can hope to study them and then deduce uh, what the central engine, the mechanism was that exploded the star. So what do these x-ray maps tell us about Cassiopeia A itself? That uh, supernova on the cover of the Journal of Emergence? Well, if we look at these low energy x-rays below that dividing line of 10, all right, we can pick out by isolating different colors, we can pick out different elements. We can pick out iron. If we look at this remnant in iron, it kind of looks like that, the shape of that bubbly, sloshing explosion, right? If you look at it in silicon magnesium, you see something that looks very much like that elongated uh, jet-like explosion. So what's going on? Well, as it turns out, uh, so it's um, kind of like a crime scene investigator that goes on, wants to look at what made a bomb explode, right? So they study the distribution of shrapnel. And what you can do in the low energy x-rays is to just study the outer layers of the bomb, okay, the casing. But you can't actually look at the explosive device. To look at the explosive device, you need to not look at uh, elements, glowing el hot elements that you see in the low energy x-ray, but you need a new tool in the, in the CSI toolbox, okay? And what Newstar has added is the ability to look at supernova remnants, not in the hot glowing embers, but in radioactive material. And radioactivity is <laughs> Uh, these ra unstable uh, radioactive elements are produced in the very core of the explosion, near the uh, explosive device of the bomb. And you see uh, when these unstable elements are created, they change from one into the other, in this case titanium into calcium, releasing high energy x-rays, 68 and 78, not 10, that's above 10, right? So not visible by previous sensitive telescope we've had. This is an entirely new tool to x-ray the heart of the explosion. And when we do that, we did that with New Star. What we found was here's iron, silicon magnesium. Again, New Star has added the blue colors to the palette. This is what the true heart or mechanism of the explosion looks like. And you s can see that it's very similar to that simulation I showed where the core of the star is sort of bubbling uh, prior to the explosion. And so we have now uh, 
basically determined that that is the mechanism through analyzing these data that exploded this star, telling us something fundamental about the process that distributes the elements in the universe. So here is Cassiopeia A and its panchromatic glory, uh, adding what the low energy X-ray telescope Chandra has seen in red and green, adding the uh, blue of new star. And I want to say one thing that I really love about science is that you solve one problem and you find a new mystery. Now, before New Star launched, we spent a lot of effort making these detectors sensitive to this radioactive glow. And a lot of theorists told me that we were wasting our time because everybody knows that the iron in one of these explosions is created in the same place as this radioactive material, so all New Star would see would make was we would see that the iron, already seen by Chandra, it looks exactly the same as the titanium, uh, or the I'm sorry, the radioactive glow. And you can see there's the blue is the radioactive, there's the red that the iron. And you can tell me, Joanna, do they look the same? <laughs> no, I think the answer is clearly no. And so this is a new mystery that has been uh, created by this observation, which is telling us something, again, about the way that elements are synthesized, where they're synthesized in these kinds of explosions. So I'm going to end there. There's lots more science I could talk about. I'll just say that we launched in 2012. We had a prime mission that lasted two years. Here's June 13th, 2014, scientists around the world uh, celebrating. I happened to be in Cambridge, England at the time. Uh, we have champagne. Everybody else has coffee. That was due to the time difference. <laughs> but celebrating New Star's uh, two-year anniversary, we've now gone into what's called a guest observer phase, where instead of the science team planning the observations, you yourself could write a proposal to use New Star to look at the universe. So New Star's time is now open to what's called guest observing. And so I think there will be uh, lots more fun to come. Thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Harrison? Yeah, so we've looked at several other uh, very famous supernova remnants uh, that are providing a confirmation of what we saw with Cassiopeia uh, A. One is uh, Supernova 1987A, which exploded in 1987. And uh, with that, by being able to analyze with exacting detail the colors uh, present in this radioactive glow, we were able to show that a similar mechanism, um, this very sort of asymmetric sloshing type mechanism, also exploded supernova 1987A. And there are a few others. It's a hard measurement to make. They're not, the issue is that the remnant has to be quite young, less than about 500 years because the radioactivity eventually decays away and you can't see it anymore, and relatively close. So, you know, we'll build a bigger telescope uh, to look at more distant remnants, but we have now uh, observed a number where we see the same evidence. How do you separate the colors of the, of the edges? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and here I'm going to be tempted to get into a, a little more uh, detail, but I'll try to make the physics understandable. So when you have a, these X-ray, the detectors, we have a, a mirror, just like the lens in your camera, right, and a detector, just like the detector in your camera. 
uh, which <clears throat> has filters to separate out red, green, and blue light. What we're actually able to do with our X-ray detectors is every, um, we're able to register uh, the X-rays and measure the color uh, directly by how much energy is deposited in the detector. So we just measure the energy deposited in the detector and that corresponds to the color of the X-ray light. Well, uh, this wasn't a proof of concept. The proof of concept for this telescope was actually a balloon experiment that uh, we did uh, where we, balloons are much less expensive. You can't really get a lot of observing time. What ha you put them on these big balloons that carry the payload but up into the stratosphere so you can get up above most of the atmosphere. And that a balloon experiment we were able to launch and observe for a couple of days and show that the optics and the detectors worked. And that's what made, the success of that is what made NASA decide to invest in New Star. And I should say New Star was a competitive proposal. We had to write a proposal and compete against many other groups uh, to say, look, we have a technology, we have a, a concept for science. But I will say now that New Star has been operated for many years, I am starting to think about what should come next. And should we do something that's bigger, more sensitive, and can make crisper images uh, than New Star? And I, I think the answer is yes. I have a question. What's the future? Right now it's in guest observing mode. How long will that last? How long will it continue to remain operational? So the way NASA, all missions after they, they have a certain amount of time that NASA guarantees that, that, that they will be funded and observe, and after that amount of time, all missions write proposals to be extended. And so we have just written, a, we wrote a proposal in 2016 uh, that was accepted and extended us for two more years, and then we'll write another one to extend us for two more years, and we'll keep doing that until something breaks, or until NASA, you know, funding expires. And um, but right now we're still doing a lot of, we still have a lot of people applying to use the telescope. It's very competitive, and so I think we have many more years uh, where we can do different kinds of observations. And I just gave this one example of supernova explosions. I should say that. New Star is looking at black holes. We're able to measure the spin of black holes. Uh, we're able to study how black holes influence the evolution of galaxies. Uh, all sorts of things. We've even looked at the sun to look at it, energetic processes on the sun. So there's lots more uh, we can still do that's new. What exactly Okay, so we're not actually seeing the black hole. Black holes are black. <laughs> no light can escape from a, within something called the event horizon. But what we're actually seeing is we're seeing the matter that's falling onto the black hole. So black holes don't live in isolation. They live in galaxies with lots of dust and gas. The gravity of the black hole attracts that dust and gas. And as it falls onto the black hole, it organizes itself into a disk-like structure, and friction in the material falling on heats it and creates regions where particles are accelerated to very high energies and radiate X-rays. And so we're able in the high-energy X-ray to study the uh, shape of that disk-like structure, and in particular, how close it comes to the black hole. If the black hole has something that we call spin, then the material can come in much closer, and we can actually measure that the closest distance that material comes before it plunges into the black hole. And that's a way we can, for example, tell if the black hole is spinning, which is kind of amazing, just by studying that, that uh, disk-like structure. Uh, we're able, one thing I, um, 
didn't mention is that uh, the kinds of high-energy x-rays we're looking at, it's the same type of x-ray that your dentist and doctor use to x-ray your teeth and, and bones. And that's because they're very penetrating. They penetrate through your skin. And this, by looking at the, this very penetrating radiation, we're able to discover black holes and objects that are hidden by a lot of dust and gas in galaxies that are invisible if you look at the redder uh, X-ray colors. So we're finding new objects that haven't been uh, seen before, uh, new black holes, and being able to study them behind these shrouds of dust and gas. Yeah, so there are a number uh, of key things. Uh, one is those detectors that I mentioned. Uh, low energy X-ray telescopes use silicon-based sensors that are very much like the one in your cell phone or digital camera. But just as I mentioned that high energy X-rays are penetrating, that means they're harder to detect and they would just go straight through that silicon. So we had to develop new kinds of materials to detect them that would actually stop these penetrating x-rays. And the uh, lenses, the x-ray lenses, are very uh, different than optical lenses. And to make them work, you know, these very blue x-ray colors took entirely new uh, approaches. So x-rays, you can't make a lens that, that basically bends an x-ray. You have to reflect them at very glancing angles. The higher, the bluer the x-ray, the more glancing the angle that you have to reflect it at. So we had to make these optics or, that would focus at very, very glancing angles. And we had to develop special coatings to coat the optics. Uh, again, to enhance their reflectivity to the, at, at blue colors. So that was all what we, what we did for the uh, balloon experiment. Now that extendable structure is very interesting. That was actually developed for something called the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, which was a mission that was a Defense Department mission that took basically a radar system up in the shuttle bay, extended that a very similar structure out that was 60 meters, so six times longer than ours, in order to bounce uh, radar beams off the Earth and get differential measurements of the topography of the Earth, the sub-centimeter level. So that was done by JPL for this completely different mission. And so when I was thinking of trying to propose this and how we would get this telescope in such a small envelope, I, I went up to JPL to talk to people and they said, oh, that's all you want, 33 feet? We've done much more than that. And so uh, we were able to adopt their structure, but I'll just, say that one scary thing was we didn't have the money to actually deploy the whole thing on the ground because remember there's no gravity in space, right? If you try to deploy the thing in, on the ground, you've got these very heavy lenses and spacecraft and you have to offload gravity extremely accurately or you break the whole thing. So we decided, you know, we don't want to risk breaking the whole thing. So we never deployed the whole thing all put together. Uh, so that was what made that particularly gripping. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, go ahead. Oh, I did that. I should say that water thing was not my uh, <coughs> uh, experiment. That was done by somebody else. But anyway, go ahead. So that was what, what it is, is it's basically a bowl that's shaped with a lip and then, uh, you know, sort of a deep portion. And so that's basically a boundary between the shallow water flowing on and the deeper 
uh, bowl of, of water. And so it's a little bit like what we call a shock. You know, there's a, the water smoothly flows on, but then, you know, it counters this, this deeper bowl where it sort of hits that uh, mass of water. Right, exactly. So, uh, good question. There, there are lots of objects out there that have been studied in the optical, the infrared, low energy or red and yellow colors of x-rays, but never been looked at in the sort of blue colors of x-rays. And so people propose, they say, we want to look with new stars so we can see where the hottest, most energetic regions are in this particular object, which will tell us you know, something about the physics that are going on in it. That would be one example. Another example would be, you know, I have a galaxy. I know there's lots of dust and gas. I suspect there's a big black hole there, but I don't know because we can't see it any other way. So let's use New Star to penetrate that cloak of dust and gas and see if there's a big black hole there. So th those would be two examples of why, uh, so that, you know, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of objects out there where New Star can provide this new information. And we haven't looked at them all. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrison. Let's thank our speaker. Okay. Our, our uh, small audience tonight, perhaps more people will come back from the uh, observing. Okay. You what? You counted a million people. Excellent. That must have taken a long time. Um, okay. So our, our panel Q&A tonight uh, is made up of Heidi Wu, who's a postdoc here at Caltech, Maria Okunkova, I mispronounce that name every time, uh, advanced graduate student here, Astrid Lambert's postdoc here, and me, uh, postdoc here. So, what questions do we have from our audience tonight? Joanna, what question do you have? What is your favorite color? What's my favorite color? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I'd say ultra, yeah, I guess it's, it's well defined. I'm blue, blue. I was going to say ultraviolet, but blue's on par with that. Do you have a question, audience member? So actually, you uh, are post, postdoctorate. Postdoctorate, yeah. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. That's that's personal for everyone, I imagine. Uh, mo most often, the, the the standard track in academia, once you complete your PhD, then you become postdoctorate because you're after your doctorate, uh, and the three of us have positions as postdoctoral uh, researchers here where we do science without, hi Joanna, our, our, our postdoctorate here, would you like to join? Okay. Um, where, we, where we do research but we don't have the obligations that professors might have in terms of teaching or uh, advising students, although you can choose to teach or choose to advise students. And then potentially uh, many of us would strive to become professors or faculty, but there are other forms of permanent positions uh, within academia, or some people leave the field, or, you know, there's a variety of things. But potentially, if you chose to be a postdoc, you actually like the science, and so you want to remain in academia in some capacity. And you have been going to school for, huh. for a long time. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to reveal my age here. Uh, I, most of us I don't think would consider a postdoc to be continuing to go to school because school ends when you get your PhD. Now we're just doing it for fun and profit, perhaps. But um, a long, a long time. Yeah. 28th grade. 28th grade? 
Nice. Yeah. And you're in fourth grade. Fourth grade. You've got a long ways to go. Long ways to go. Uh, any questions? I don't want to hog the mic. So, um, so this is sort of an example of like how you sort of develop a specialty is um, I did four years of undergrad in physics. Um, and so at the beginning, you're kind of learning general physics, which is just stuff that everybody who does anything with physics needs to know. And then as you progress, you can start to take like graduate courses in certain subjects, or you can start to do research towards the end of undergrad. And so I did a bunch of little research projects, and I discovered that what I like most um, <clears throat> is what I do right now, which is uh, gravity simulations on the computer, kind of like the one that she showed of the supernova today. but. Um, I mainly do black holes, and so when I was applying to graduate school, I picked according to uh, what was sort of best in the field. Um, and so, sort of when you come to graduate school, a lot of people have a specialty in mind already, um, but certainly people switch, people get inspired to do other things, um, but it is sort of narrower than, than an undergraduate degree. I mean, it gets narrower when you're a grad student, but then as you move in your career, typically you start widening again because you want to do something else. You've been working on something for five, six years. Uh, there's no discoveries. So it can change a lot through a career, or even in a short amount of time, just because even sometimes it's because the person in the office next door just does interesting things, and you start talking, and you have an idea, and then you can do something a bit different. Uh, it's Some of it is just random. Any questions, guys? You got you got the whole house. You can yeah. ask whatever you want. So I study galaxies observed in infrared, and they are the, like dust in the universe. It's pretty much like the dust on your bed, but they glow in infrared. And they actually tell us how much tell us how much stars each galaxies are forming. And if we observe lots of them, we can know the star formation history, basically how stars were built up in the past of our universe. Hi. Um, it says Maria because that's my official name. I go by Masha. Um, I'm doing my PhD in physics at Caltech, and what I do is simulating black holes on supercomputers. So I'm Astrid. I'm a postdoc here, and I, I don't know what it actually says there, uh, but I like every. So I like typically two things. I like uh, different stages of massive stars, especially when there's two of them, because then they interact and do a lot of interesting things. Um, and one of them is, for example, the black hole mergers that people detected with LIGO. That's the very end of it. And I also study 
uh, stuff between galaxies, which is, I mean, if you look at the sky, you see stars, and you see little blobs that are other galaxies, but most of what you see is actually black. And so I also look at that black that is very void, and I try to understand what it is. I'm, I'm Cameron. I'm also a postdoc here. I do, uh, like Masha, I do uh, computer simulations on supercomputers, but rather than looking at black holes, I look at how galaxies, like our own Milky Way, um, change and form over long periods of time. Because it's really, when you look up in the sky and you find a galaxy, and you look at it today and you look at it tomorrow, it doesn't change at all. In fact, if you look at it today and compare that picture with a picture taken 100 years ago, there's basically no change. Because the time, it takes a long time for these things to change. And so in order to see how they change over time, you, you have to set up a computer simulation and allow it to, to evolve in this kind of virtual environment on your computer to, to accelerate time. And so that tells us something about how these, these things, like galaxies, form and, and evolve. So, yeah. So, like, how many different variables do you need to do to create a simulation? A lot. <laughs> um, in the simulations that, that, that we do with galaxy evolution, you take a big, uh, well, it's all virtual space. It's all on your computer. Um, and we, we try to create a three-dimensional space that's representing a large volume of our universe. Uh, our simulations tend to be on the order of uh, 100 megaparsecs, so 300 million light years in, on a side of like a box. So really, really enormous. And within that, you have something on the order of a billion particles that represent each each uh, piece of dark matter or each piece of gas or stars or whatnot. So there's like a billion different elements to your array. And then for each array, you have a variety of different variables. If it's gas, you're, you're worried about the density of the gas, the mass of the gas, the uh, temperature of the gas, the metallicity of the gas. There's a variety of different variables, and you're keeping track of all those. So usually, to give you some idea of the number of variables, to answer your original question instead of my tangent that I've taken off on here. Uh, an output from one of these simulations, when you write it out to a disk, um, it's usually on the order of 10 gigabytes to like a terabyte in size. So as large as most people's hard drives, that's just like one snapshot in time from our simulation. So it's just enormous. It's very, very large, which is why you want to run them on supercomputing clusters uh, at national labs and that sort of thing to allow them, allow them to go forward. Because if you just tried to run it on your laptop or your desktop, you wouldn't make a lot of progress. They're just really enormous simulations. Do you have similar experiences, Masha? Yeah, so I can, um, I think the question about variables is kind of cool because, um, so the way we do black hole simulations is we use the theory of general relativity. And in general relativity, space-time itself is, your, is sort of the variable that you care about. Um, and so it's not like we have, oh, a million particles and we're moving them around. Instead, what we do is we just imagine space-time, um, but we sort of put a grid on it. So kind of like you can take a picture and have it have like a low, or like a video, um, have it have low resolution all the way through high resolution. We can similarly divide up space-time into like little... Uh, like pixels or chunks that, um, from which we can then sort of build up the whole thing. Um, and so that, that's kind of like how many variables we have. But ultimately what we really care about is this uh, sort of metric of space-time. Um, and then usually we run these things on uh, 48 cores to sort of do a simulation of two black holes um, orbiting around each other and then finally merging. This would be run on 48 cores. So that's about uh, 12 like MacBook Pros if you had them running for like four weeks. Um, so that, that's how much it takes. And black holes are a relatively simple problem. There's no gas, there's no dust around. It's just like just two very simple objects. So, um, I might get this wrong. So, yeah, so there's Cygnus X1, which I think is 6,000 light years away, um, right? Or, yeah, 
Um, and uh, this is, yeah, this is uh, an object that is in a pair. Um, and so by the motion of the companion, we postulate that this is a black hole because we see uh, something moving as though it has a companion, but then we don't see anything um, where, where there's you know, a black hole. to tie it into today's talk. So it's it's um, even though it's commonly broken up, I'll worry about that in a second. Broken up into like visible light versus X-rays and so on. It's really a continuum of different types. We're just uh, usually this is how it's drawn. Is something like that. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, and and what I'm basically showing is that each trough and, and arc here represents a different part of that spectrum. So the shortest wavelengths, the ones where the, the, the peaks are closest together, tend to be the most energetic. So these are things like gamma rays or x-rays. And then as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, um, you go to the ultraviolet, then you go to the visible spectrum that you can see with your eye, then you go to the infrared, then you go to the microwave, then you go to the radio. And so you but, but ultimately, all we're doing is saying, oh, this part of the spectrum, these are x-rays. And this part of the spectrum, this is ultraviolet. And this part of the spectrum is visible. But it's not really, it's not like a discrete chunks. It's, it's a continuum, and this all flows together. So ultimately, when we talk about observing the universe with telescopes, we bin it up this way, but it's a continuum of 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 electromagnetic radiation. So it's all of these things together. But in addition to that, to answer your original question, um, for the first time ever in the last year, we started looking at the universe in something other than electromagnetic radiation, which is? Um, something known as gravitational radiation. Um, so if you guys heard about LIGO in the news, this uh, gravitational wave observatory that made its first detection, um, or announced its first detection last year, made it um, in 2015. Um, there, this is very exciting because the way people have done astronomy for most of human history is just using light, um, or electromagnetic radiation, as Fiona said tonight. Um, but LIGO is very different in that it allows us to detect uh, gravitational radiation, which are just actually ripples or changes, um, or ripples in space-time itself. So kind of how this is due to, um, you know, some sort of emitter that, that's emitting light, and these, and if you have like something like a system of two black holes, for example, they're going to create little ripples in space-time, uh, and those are finally going to reach your detector, and you're going to be able to detect them. Uh, and it's, it's cool because a pair of black holes in space is not something that you can detect using electromagnetic radiation unless there's something like gas and dust around. And in fact, when LIGO made its first detection, um, they asked all of the telescopes, like, could you guys, you know, check your detectors, like, look at the region, do you guys see anything? and nobody uh, saw anything out of the ordinary. It was only in gravitational waves or gravitational radiation that we saw this event. So this is sort of a totally new way of looking at things. So now we have this electromagnetic astronomy, which is done with like observational telescopes and like visible light, projects like New Star, which cover the X-ray, which is sort of all the way over there. Uh, but now we have this thing sort of in parallel, which is uh, gravitational wave detection. Yes, so this is something that theoretically has been around for a hundred years. Um, so Albert Einstein was the first person to say that this should exist. Um, and then people have been thinking about detectors for this um, since, you know, the middle of the last century. 
Uh, but the first detection, the detectors were finally able to get sort of precise enough to measure uh, an event like this, um, you know, recently. And so it was just last year that the first detection was announced. So the theory, the detector, or the gravitational waves? The detector. Who came up with the, the way to figure it out? Sure. So LIGO is a pretty big collaboration. It's not huge like the um, Large Hadron Collider or CERN. Um, but LIGO has close to, I think, 1,000 scientists at this point. And so a lot of things kind of had to happen together. So a lot of the, like, theoretical work and about just thinking about what kind of detector you would need uh, was done by Kip Thorne, Ray Weiss, and Ron Drever. Um, and so they thought about using a laser, um, sort of an L-shaped laser. And the reason uh, people want to have an L-shaped laser with sort of two mirrors at the ends is because when a gravitational pass wave passes by, it's going to sort of stretch and squeeze space-time, and so it's going to stretch and squeeze the difference, uh, the distance from, let's say, where the lasers meet to uh, the mirror from which it bounces off. And so this is going to produce a change in how these two lasers are going to meet, and they're either going to add together or, like, cancel each other. Um, and so this produces a pattern, which is a wave-like pattern, which is known as a gravitational wave, or which is a signature of the gravitational wave. Um, so th that happened, I think, around the 60s that they started thinking about this. Um, but then it took a while to really develop all the technology, because gravitational waves are very weak signals. Um, there are these sort of statistics where it's like a tenth of the diameter of a proton is how much um, this distance changed. Um, and the detectors are four kilometers long, so this is like a tiny, a tiny change. So you really needed good vacuum chambers because you didn't want any noise in the detector. You needed really good, like, coatings on the mirrors. You needed really good laser light to make sure it was very clean. Um, you needed good data analysis techniques. Uh, so sort of it was a lot of R&D, um, like research and development, over a long time, um, and a lot of sort of initial runs where nobody saw anything in the data because it wasn't sensitive enough yet. The instruments just weren't like good enough yet. Um, but then finally, uh, we have this detector now, which can can do detections. Yeah. yeah. So Kip Thorne, one of the the architects of this is a former professor in this department who still comes in to some degree, although he's very busy with speaking engagements since this announcement because, you know, they were successful. And so it's a big, he's a big, he's a big deal. He's a, I mean, he was already a big deal, but now he's really, really a big deal. He also uh, wrote the movie that you may have seen, Interstellar, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, he, he wrote that, so... Yeah. He wrote, the, he wrote the original script for it. It got modified uh, in processing, but yeah. Um, and one of the characters is based on him. The character that, uh, what's his name? Michael, what's, what's the act? Michael Caine is the actor who plays the character that's based on Kip Thorne. Okay. So if you've seen the movie, you've kind of seen him. I don't know. For people who just arrived, do you guys have any questions? I know you always have very good questions. <laughs> Related to science, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, that's true. That's true. Um, okay, as Leo points out, uh, your original question earlier on was, what are ways in which we observe the universe? Is it just in x-rays and visible wavelengths and such? And I said, you know, there's the full electromagnetic spectrum that we're observing as 
as charged particles move and they emit light, we can see that. But then Masha told us about gravitational waves, but there are a few other ways that we can observe the universe, and that is um, certain kind of particles that have, tr that have been emitted by uh, distant astronomical objects and uh, eventually travel and arrive at us and our detectors. So things like neutrinos, which are very, very light particles, um, much lighter than, than a proton or a neutron. Uh, and because they're, they're called neutrinos because they're neutral in terms of not having a positive or negative charge. So they aren't influenced by magnetic fields or anything like that. And they can travel very effectively long, long distances without interacting with things. Um, and so we can observe those. There's, there are detectors uh, at the, in Antarctica, the South Pole. There's a detector called Ice Cube. Um, it's a neutrino detector or a... Okay, it is. And uh, what's, it's pretty amazing. So I'm getting really off tangent here, but I'm going to keep going. Um, in Antarctica, there's a lot of ice, right? Uh, neutrinos, when they do, they, they can travel very long distances without interacting with other particles. But when they do interact, it's typically, uh, they're traveling very, very fast, near the speed of light. And when they travel through, uh, certain matter like ice or water, for instance, they will be traveling at faster than the speed of light in that particular substance. Not faster than the speed of light overall, but the, the speed of light in, in uh, glass is slower than it is in the air, which is slower than it is in a vacuum. So these things are traveling along, zooming along, and then they enter a piece of ice or water. And all of a sudden, uh, they're traveling faster than what's allowed by kind of the laws of physics in that medium. And it causes what's effectively the, the optical counterpart to a sonic boom. Yeah, and it's, called, it's, it's accompanied by this bluish light called Cherenkov light. And so if you see uh, uh, these flashes of blue in the ice, it reveals that there are neutrinos traveling through it. And so what they've done, there's this instrument called Ice Cube. It's built by, it's, it's because it's an ice cube, uh, it's, it's built by, they take um, photo detectors, basically like little cameras almost, and they drop them into the ice. They, they take a big hot water jet and shoot it down into the ice to melt this little tiny column of hot water in the ice. And then the, while that water is water and not yet frozen, because of, of course this is Antarctica, um, they drop down this cable that has all of these photo detectors on it. And it goes down like half a mile or something. It goes way, way, way down. And then it, they let it sit there. And then it refreezes because it's surrounded by ice. And then they have this perfect detector for being able to detect when, when you have this Cherenkov light, when you have this blue light from neutrinos passing through that, in, that enormous ice sheet. Um, and they've been able to do some pretty amazing stuff with it, uh, even though it's just like this crazy idea for building this crazy detector. Anyway, I'm monopolizing the conversation here. Um, do, do you guys want to They also have a detector like that in the Mediterranean Sea, because instead of having the ice, they just have the seawater. And it works in the same way. Uh, the only thing I sort of remember from this is that when they actually turned it on for the very first time, they saw way more light than they expected. And it turned out they were seeing shrimp. Because shrimp make apparently a little bit of blue light. Yeah, and so they had to figure out how to stop looking at shrimp. But, uh, <laughs> but so those things also happen. Uh, that's about all I know about neutrino detectors. I did not prepare for this. <laughs> you know the answer. For some, you need to be not to not be in a vacuum, right? Yeah. Well, it's just, well, it's good. Okay. So in a neutrino side, the speed of sound can be really fast, right? Does that change when it gets into the black hole? Well, what we can, our official answer, I think, I'll have to check with my colleagues here, uh, because. Once you enter the event horizon of a black hole, so a black hole, right? You guys know about black holes. 
At the very center is the singularity where all the mass is contained, and it's in an infinitesimal point. And then beyond that, surrounding that, is what's called the event horizon. And at the event horizon, that is where uh, its, its uh, uh, infall velocity is equal to, uh, of things that are falling onto it, its escape velocity is equal to the speed of light. So within the event horizon, nothing, no information, not even light itself, can escape that region, which is why it's black, right? Because light, if light can't escape from it, then it's black. But it also means no information can travel from outside of that region. So we can, we can officially say that that is a disconnected part of the universe that we can never fully observe. And so we don't know what, uh, we, we, can, we can officially say that we don't know what's going on in that region near the singularity because it's in this disconnected part of the universe. But um, the speed of sound is dictated by the particle density around that, and presumably within the event horizon, all of the mass is contained in a singularity point. What? No. There could just be matter that's infalling at faster than the speed of light onto that structure. I don't know. I don't know what. Well, okay. It's just accelerating. Beyond neutron star densities. Or if it would behave as a fluid at all. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. Did your students know? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. So at the time of the detection, only two detectors um, were turned on. Um, and so there's this other, uh, there are other detectors in um, Virgo and then Geo um, and Kagra. Um, so at the time, only two detectors were turned on, and the, re the sky localization was not very good at all. Um, it was sort of pretty dispersed. But um, there are still instruments that do um, sort of uh, can, can cover large patches of the sky at once, and th there are sort of lots of instruments that are signed up for, um, like, alerts from LIGO. Um, and so at the time, the one sort of they pointed or like looked at their data during that time um, and sort of worked with what they had and there wasn't any um, electromagnetic counterpart that they saw. But certainly um, as more detectors come online, the sky localization will be a lot better. Um, and then this network of astronomers can actually po like directly point their instruments much better. Um, and then, you know, you will be able to make better claims about is there an electromagnetic counterpart or not. Um, Less than a second. <laughs>
but you, you can if you want to. Well, um, so you can, <clears throat> if there were, um, if there was something around like a disk, for example, if there was a disk around one of the black holes during the merger event, um, everything would get highly excited and you'd probably get like a large glow. Um, and so this would be kind of observable um, in, in various detectors. Um, one sort of thing that's interesting is that um, one detector uh, looked at its data and it did find a small um, a, a small signal um, and people argued about the data analysis that went into this and whether or not the signal was significant but what was interesting is that with this small signal a bunch of papers were written that were like constructing scenarios of how there was there are certain types of matter or like magnetic fields um, around these black holes that could have created this uh, small signal. Um, so certainly if you have some sort of uh, electromagnetic counterpart, there are various uh, types of scenarios. Um, but for the events, uh, the two gravitational wave detections by LIGO in question, um, we don't uh, currently think this, there was sort of such a thing. Because for, I mean, if we want there to be uh, normal light, there has to be gas around or dust and at least from what we understand now, we don't expect there to be much around just two black holes sitting somewhere. Yes, we're all. Yeah. So we don't expect that when they merge, there would be any gas. But if a black hole merges with a neutron star, for example, then you would obviously have the matter from the neutron star that will create initially probably gamma rays and then the UV, and then it will basically go from the high energy to the low energy over time. So then we hope that if we have a gamma ray detector, and so gamma ray detectors are usually, they see all the sky. They're like a box in space and they see light coming from everywhere. So if I have the box here, I see light from there, from there, from there. And so you can hope to have almost the whole sky at a given time. So hopefully we can use them to say, okay, it's probably much more there and then have the real, the, the optical telescopes actually look in that sm small sp patch of the sky. That's the hope that we will get the information from the gamma rays and that it will then uh, go to lower energy. That's the hope. But we'll have to get lucky, I think. So after the first observing run, um, which ended, I think, before the summer, um, LIGO claimed two detections um, that were above five sigma, and then it had one detection or like one event um, that was less than the five sigma level. I think it was around the two sigma level. Um, so that was sort of claimed as a candidate rather than an event. Uh, then it went into a uh, mode where it was going through upgrades um, and then it recently uh, was turned on for a second observing run um, and there will be um, one sort of as the data gets analyzed um, as sort of events and triggers happen um, there will be probably um, two more events that will need to be uh, sort of done like in kind of like secret press um, because they have to have four events before they can make all the data just public as it's sort of coming in. Um, and then after they have four events, I think they plan to make all their data public. So then it's like it can be something where people can observe it themselves and sort of see if there's anything. Um, <clears throat> I think the second one had uh, a comparable total mass. Um, so the first one had a total mass of a, around 60 solar masses, and then the second one was something similar. Uh, for the, it was smaller? It was like, oh, okay, I guess it was smaller. If, do you want to? No, it's probably not. Okay, yeah, it was it like 14 and 10. Okay, yeah, I guess they're smaller. 